All right, guys, welcome again, one and all, to another episode of Fire Builders Live. My name is Josh Corporal, and I am streaming live from Key West, Florida, as always. And today we have an amazing guest, Walter Estrada, is on the show. Walter, welcome to Fire Builders Live. Thank you, man. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing okay, man. How are you doing? Fine, fine. It's a, it's an honor to have you. I've been following your work now for like the last two years. Uh, ever since I heard about your trip, which we're going to get into in just a second. Uh, but, but guys, if this is the first time that you are uh, watching or listening to Fire Builders Live, let me tell you a little bit about how it works. What we do is we bring on experts and we take these big topics, we break them down into small steps, things that you can do every day to remain consistent and to improve. And today is going to be quite an amazing show. So honestly, if you guys are here, comment below. Let us know that you're here, right? Share this with your friends. Today's episode is going to be quite amazing. And I'm going to see if I can pull this off because I am going to attempt to describe all of the amazing things that Walter has done in addition to sharing some of the photographs. And let me do that right now. Let me just show you guys some of these things. What you're seeing on the screen right now are some of the pictures. And let me explain to you the kind of things that Walter has done. He is the recipient of three World Press Photo Awards, Photo Journalist of the Year, Photographer of the Year, the Beo Calva... Uh, oh, hold on. Let, me, let me make sure I'm pronouncing that right. Is it Beo Calvado? By you. By you. By you Calvados Award for War Correspondence, among many others. He is a photographer for news agencies covering conflicts and creating long-term documentaries on social issues. Some of these images that you're looking at were taken all over the world where he's lived in places like Bolivia, Argentina, Paraguay, Dominican Republic, Uganda, and Eastern Africa. But I'll tell you, one of the reasons that I wanted to bring him on the show today is because, and there he is, hold on, let's go back, is because of what he has been doing for the last five years. For the last five years, probably over five years now, he has been on the road with his 19, uh, 2012 Royal Enfield motorcycle, which is a fantastic bike. And uh, and he's been traveling around. He's been working. He's been shooting. Again, these are some of the photographs. Some of his best work is right here. And he's going to be talking about the things that he has learned on the road as he's working and traveling and staying in these places and integrating himself with the people and the culture and understanding essentially the world around him and not just that, but freezing it in time for people to see. So Walter, seriously, man, let me just say, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome again to Fire Builders Live. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. What, uh, you know, what I like to do when we first start out here is uh, I like to ask the guests, where are you right now in the world? And for you, it's even more applicable. Where are you in the world? And what is a typical day in Walter's life these days? Well, now it's, it's a really complicated timing because, uh, I mean, with this virus, we are basically I am out of what I was doing. You say that I, I, I'm driving my motorcycle for the last five years. But in March, I decided to, well, not decide, I needed to come to, to Spain to do some paperwork for the bike and also teaching photography. And I arrived on Tuesday and on Saturday, they declared a quarantine. So basically, since March 14th, I am here in Spain without knowing when I can go back to Bolivia where the bike is. Um, so let's say that now uh, I am just a little out of, of where I was in the last uh, five years. The uh, and the bike is back in Bolivia, and there's really, there's really you're trying to figure out essentially how to either are you trying to bring the bike to Spain or are you trying to go back to Bolivia? No, I am trying to go back to Bolivia. Uh, exactly in this week and the next week, I am trying to renew a paper that allow the bike to stay longer in in Bolivia um, for another six months. So I hope that we can travel anytime soon between now and six months. So something <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, complicated. Saying, Not really it complicated. Is, it is complicated, right? I mean, most people, when they hear about 
these motorcycle trips, they think, oh, you just hop on the bike and go. There's a lot of paperwork involved. Well, the problem is if you travel by, by, by bicycle, it's okay. I mean, you just leave the bike and nobody cares about it. But as soon as you, you put an engine with a serial number on it, you are inside a, a lot of paperwork that, you know, it, it's just crazy. The amount of paperwork that sometimes you need just to cross the border. Huh? And the problem is now with the bike is, in Bolivia, the bike can be six months, but I spent five months in Spain. So basically I, I need to extend it. So it's crazy. Normally. Uh, what I was doing if I wanted to stay longer in Bolivia, I just go to the border, cross to Argentina or Peru or Chile, I stay some days there and then come back and I have another six months. But now I even, you know, and also in, in Bolivia now the, the roads are blocked because it's, a, it's a, like a, there are some uh, political problems too. So even if I was there, I was not able to go out. So I, I hope the uh, uh, customs people is doing, you know, easy and just say, okay, man, you can stay six months longer and like it will special circumstances. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, I'm curious, I'm curious as to why you decided on the motorcycle as opposed to all these other different modes of travel. What is it for you? Why the, the Enfield, you mean? Yeah, why the Enfield and why just a motorcycle in, in general? I mean, there's so many oh, different okay. ways that you could travel the world. Well, uh, at the beginning, the idea was um, doing it as a normal way. I mean, with a backpack and that's it. I wanted to take a break of my work as photojournalist. Uh, I was thinking to take, you know, a holiday of one year traveling around, blah, blah. And I was in Haiti working there and we were using bikes to move around and I asked one of the guys if he was teaching me how to use a motorcycle. Even I didn't know how to use a motorcycle. So I we went to a, to a field and I was I jumped on the bike and I was really afraid of bikes before and I'm still I am a little now but um, I thought man what why I didn't make it be previously I mean why I, I was just too afraid of doing I mean, riding a bike, and I was covering conflicts, you know. Uh, I was covering yeah, yeah. You know, very dangerous things, and but I was afraid of motorcycles, so it's crazy. So that day I, I decided to to do the trip I wanted to do, but then on a motorcycle. And basically because the doing bicycle uh, with a bike, I mean, with a, with a um, uh, not, I mean, with the cycling, uh, I, I feel I was too old to do that, you know, it, it, it requires a lot of energy. And then uh, in a car, in a van, I, I, I think that isolated you a lot from the people. Uh, so the motorcycle was just in the middle. I mean, was was giving me the, the same, or not the same path, but at least quite similar uh, way of traveling if I was cycling, but also give me the uh, the chance of meeting people in different ways that if you are riding a car or in a van, you know, it's, it's, it's completely different because uh, if you are in a van, normally you will have a place to sleep and to eat. And you you have to park the, bike, the, the van and walk. With a motorcycle, you arrive in a town and everybody knows that you are in a motorcycle. So, that gave me, you know, the, the possibility of uh, of getting in touch with the people in a not in the best way because I think bicycling is the best way because really when you see uh, somebody arriving arriving with a with a bicycle, everybody is just trying to help him. With a motorcycle, it's not yeah. that it's not like, like that. I could take care of himself. Yeah, but uh, still, you know, you're in the middle. And yep. well, so, and then after that, I, I came to Spain back and uh, I, I bought a bike and I took my, my license and then I started preparing the trip. That uh, the first part has a lot of paperwork because of visas and all this stuff. You know, I'm so glad that you, that you talk about the fact that it brings you closer to the people because 
I've experienced that same thing. Like if you're in a car or a van, you're separated, right? You don't have an excuse to go out and to talk with people. And when you're on the bike, just like you said, I mean, you pull right into a town and, and people want to know who you are. I mean, you're self-sufficient and, you know, they, it's a conversation starter. It's unique and different. Uh, and you earned, you almost earned your way there in a way, right? Depending on where you are. Uh, I, I just, I think it's the best way to travel and see the world and meet people. Well, for example, my bike is from India, right? I mean, I bought it here in Madrid, but it's from India. And I was in India with my motorcycle on the trip. And even it's a, it's an Indian bike, uh, but I am foreigner. So anytime I was reaching a gas petrol station or any place, man, I was surrounded by people, you know, it's like, yeah. because it's an Enfield that is from India and, and you know, the, the, the proud of, of, of the people is about the Enfields in India. So, and then seeing a guy from abroad, bringing a bike on a trip like that. And also I have the names of the country I, I was passing through on the on the boxes so everybody start reading that and said man you were here 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 so it's uh you know it, it's a it's a and sometimes i'm not kidding sometimes it's a queue waiting to take a selfie with you it's yeah. amazing yeah uh, and the same happened to me in, in in indonesia really i mean it's a people just stop you on, on the road just can i take a picture with you it's like it's, it's just crazy so and that is a it's a way of a starting talking, you know. It's a it's a it's a, it's a very good way of uh, of of a start getting close to the people. So it's good. Yeah, and developing kind of an understanding with people. And uh, and I I I totally feel you, man. I uh, you know, there's at least in places in India, there's not there's not necessarily a sense of personal space. You know, no. everything is so small. <laughs> no way. So yeah. there. Like they'll they'll uh, stop you and ask you those questions, and then one guy will hop on the bike. He'll sit on it, and you know they just they just without even asking. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Don't care at all, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's the... crazy. And then I mean, if you camp, if you use a tent, you can open the tent and will be surrounded by people. You know, it's just it's just crazy. Yeah. Uh, I remember one time I had to repair something on the bike. I mean, just to was a was a nut or something like that. And basically, I had no space to work because everybody was trying to look what I was working, you know. So I have faces all around me. It's like, it's yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, it is. It is crazy. It's like, uh, you know, and and especially in India with Royal Enfield, you're right. Like they still pride themselves on that type of bike. And there were, I mean, there were seven, eight year old kids that knew how to fix and completely tear the bike down and build it right back up again yeah, better right. than any mechanic in the states exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and really cheap anyway yeah exactly and uh and just teaching you how things work and oh man i i so freaking miss it and uh and that's why you know do, have you done much riding in the in the states in the united states no no yet no no with them yeah. no no, it, I, it's the plan. It's you guys have a, a road that is called Tat, Trans American Trail or something like yep. that. Yep. So yeah, basically that's my idea when I reach. Uh, yes, but now I'm really far away. I mean, it's like I don't know when. <laughs> Even I don't know if, if we can travel. I don't know. It's, it's just a a huge uh, cloud. On, in you know, but we will see. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that's my idea in, in, in US. I think can be very I don't know if you did that, but I think can be amazing. I do too. Yeah, and I've never done it. Never done it. I've wanted to though. Um and well so I'm curious, right? Because as you go through these places, there's a there's always a line to be drawn, a balance between you as a photographer wanting to get into the scene and wanting to experience it for yourself and take in moments for yourself. Okay. And then on the other hand, the responsibility of having your equipment and trying to capture that in time for everyone else to see as well. And I feel like there's a balance there. How do you balance that between for yourself? Well, um, 
You know, on, on the trip, I am shooting completely different pictures that I was shooting before. Normally, before was human rights violations, uh, social issues, etc. On the trip, it's only about the daily life of people. And also a lot of uh, that have to do with uh, celebrations or festivities or all these kind of things. Um, so sometimes it's, uh, I mean, not sometimes. That means that the, um, the, the work I have to do to get into the, 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 the place to take pictures is easier because I'm not trying to, uh, to take pictures of things that nobody wants to see because it's a normal life for them, even as a celebration, I don't know. So that makes a huge difference in, uh, because it's, no, I, I don't want to say easy, but it's easier than the previous work. Um, do, they, do they like? Do they accept you pretty I, easily? I mean, they bring you in, and they yeah. And also, arriving with a motorcycle is is a is a it gives you a different um, approach. For example, I remember stopping in a small town that I mean, even I didn't knew that existed, and the people is asking you why you came to our town, and I said, well, man, I don't know. Your tongue is on my road, you know. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, I mean, I, I didn't know your tongue was uh, was a place until today. Uh, but I, and then sometimes places like this, I just I stop and then I, I start looking around and walking and said, "Wow, man, I love this place." You know, I, I'm going to stay longer. And sometimes you. You have in the mind, I don't know, to go to New York for to say something, and you arrive to New York and said, "Oh man, I, I want to go out." You know, uh, so sometimes it's like you stay longer in places that you didn't know, and places that everybody wants to go, you just pass by. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, it's a completely different way of of, of traveling. When in my case. And um, when you don't have a time, like a schedule in any way, it's not like you have to be here on this date and here on this day. You could stay if you, or do you? Well, uh, the first six months of the trip were um, so so uh, because I started in Barcelona and my idea was to reach Vladivostok, that is Russia, on the stream, Russia. So you have to, buy, to pass Iberia there and Mongolia. I wanted to go to Mongolia. So Mongolia started getting coal in September, you know? So it's, uh, and then Siberia, maybe October, I don't know. So uh, I have like six months to do 22,000 kilometers. So uh, I have to plan a little, you know, like, uh, and also in that part of the trip, I have to have uh, some visas. For example, for Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, um, also Azerbaijan, but I, ne I never get into Azerbaijan because when I reached to the border it was too soon. So I didn't even wait for the visa. So I just continued. I did the I did a loop through the Caspian Sea and that's it. Um, but uh, besides these six months that were like, you know, and also, I have a problem with the bike in, in that part of the trip. Uh, and a stone broke my engine, so I have to repair it. It took me like three or four days to repair it, but then I needed a, a new uh, uh, part of the bike to change because it was, you know, when we weld, was smaller. So I have to wait for five days to get that part. So I lost 10 days there. Uh, yeah. there. That is a lot in six months. Uh, but after that, when and after that, I reached Vladivostok. That was almost end of October, end of October, something like that. From there, I crossed by boat, by ferry to South Korea. I was one month there, and from there, I shipped the bike by plane to India. And since then, I didn't plan too much because the visas are quite easy. Uh, what Problem crossing Burma, uh, Burma because um, you can cross, but you you need to do with a guide and with somebody from the government, etc., etc. Like so they have to, they have to like escort you. Days. 
and you do a group because in that way you put the the expenses down okay you split the expenses with other bikers or, or travelers they, so, uh, they they escort you across the country like you can't go by yourself no you can't only okay. they they allow you to go in in the very touristic areas i mean like uh there are two or three places where you can move around but normally you cross the country i mean you mm -hmm. don't have too much time to enjoy it's, it's pity because it's a beautiful country um but at, at least you can do it in that way in the past was forbidden so you can you need to go to india then nepal and from nepal people was shipping the bike to um to thailand but after that normally it was easy i mean you can move you cross border you have visas again the permit renew oh, sorry the the permit renew again blah 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 so the first six months were like a little complicated but after that it's i mean in the last two years i have been in south america basically for riding in five countries so i was in basically in two years i did something like uh 28 countries and in two years i did five so it's a <laughs> completely different different pace you know and it's i feel like the the pace in south america and when you know after the first six months where you could relax a little bit uh it just gives you the opportunity to pursue what you want i, I feel like it's such maybe a little bit more fulfilling of a sense of travel like because you can stay and you can discover these places that were undiscovered before that you never knew and you don't have to waste time in touristy areas uh, that everybody goes to. No, for example, in uh, in Bolivia, um, I, I gave uh, like a lecture or talk to bikers there. And, um, and after that, I was talking with one guy and said, I can give you some different roads to do in Bolivia if you want. So, and he named a place that is called Toro Toro. It's in between Cochabamba and Sucre, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, really in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but it's beautiful there. So um, I said, okay, I will go. And he said, well, there are one, I mean, you can go and you come back in the same road, or you can go and you keep going, but then literally you have to jump into a, into a mountain to cross to the other side. So I did that. Nobody, <laughs> no, no many people is going there because a lot of people is doing that just in emergency with a four by four. Mm -hmm. So, and I did what with the motorcycle and man was hard, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, when you say you, you get what you, what you paid. So it was hard, but the, the, what the places that I saw there and, and the views I saw there was amazing. So, and that is not possible if you are with uh, with a timeline. You know, it's like you you don't change your role because oh no no I have to go here or some. So, but that's it. I mean, I'm lucky in a way because I, I since the beginning I tried to be able to do that. I mean, to if I wanted to stay, I should I say, except the six months. Yep. But after that, you know, if I wanted to go to some place, I just stay and try to, to renew the papers or visa in, in the way that is possible. So. Well, I'll tell you, you know, a question came up here, and I'm going to put it up on the screen so you can see it, right? <clears throat> From Perry, and she said, uh, do you fear traveling alone? And it's a good question because when people hear your story and they hear the things that you're doing, of course they're going to they're gonna have that fear of being by themselves and having something happen and not necessarily being able to rely on themselves to get themselves out of trouble, you know, whatever. Uh, how have you, how, were, were you afraid to do this at first uh, at all? Well, uh, you know, I, it's, a, it's a good question really because normally uh, it's, it's a question that every, I mean, I did myself even before starting the trip. I, I in, on the on my site, I have uh, I I have a blog. At the beginning of the trip, I was writing a lot, then I stopped, and then during the quarantine, I was writing again. But um, I had a lot of fear before because, okay, I didn't know how to use a motorcycle. Quite, I mean, I was learning, so basically, I continued learning what I was 
writing. Uh, and then it's not the same writing on the tarmac than writing off road. You know, it's completely different. So that's, um, of course, in my case, were a lot of fear in that point. But at the end, man, I am here. So it, it is it is possible to to cope with that fear, and that fear also is helping you to 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 do what you want to do in some ways. And then I, I wrote an, an another post about fear, and the the worst part of of, of having fear of something is basically it's not a bad thing to have fear. The problem is not doing things because you are fear of something. You know, it's yep. like. And I have, I have like two, three accidents on the bike on the trip. Uh, one was very serious. The last one um, was it. Was it you that ended up causing the accident? Did someone else hit you? Like no, uh, the last one um, in Bolivia, they put the stones on the road just to to say that will be like a deviation. And when I was doing the deviation, a, a dog shark crossed. In front of me, I tried to avoid the dog and I hit the, the stone like, ah. so I broke my hand, blah, blah. So, but it's okay. I mean, but you know, uh, after five minutes of trying to, you know, I, I was holding my hand like that because it was the, the, the bone was like, not out, but was, was a scary. And five minutes after, just, you know, uh, was a truck arriving with the family was empty where normally they were going to the market to to buy potatoes or i don't know onion something like that so they were going in the same direction i was going so i asked man can you can we just put the bike on on your truck I said yeah of course but you know i cannot do anything because i no no problem so was the the husband the wife and two kids i mean two kids of 20 or something like that so between this these four they put the bike on the top. They lift it up and put it on yeah, the truck. Exactly. Yeah. So they took me to the place, and after, I mean, after five minutes, I was safe again. I mean, with the hand, you know, broken, etc. But always, what I, I think it's always will be there somebody to help, and it's amazing. Always that I got a problem, always was somebody able to help me. So. And in Bolivia, I was speaking the language, but it happened when I broke the bike in Uzbekistan. Nobody speaks even English. So, you know, I, I remember I, I wrote an article about that too, because uh, I was with the bike and was leaking oil because it has a hole like that. And in the middle of nowhere is the Pamir Road there. It's, a, it's the border with Afghanistan, okay? So it's like, man, you are, I mean, I was, Fuck, I am really shit here. But the, um, soon, I don't know, two or three hours later, a, a van arrived with people, and they just make a space between the, the goats and the, the stuff they were carrying, and then put my bag there. And, you know, it's like... That and how that happens. After 24 hours after that, I was back in, in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, in a in a place in a in a in a shop where I can't repair the bike because they were renting bikes to do tours. So, yeah, I'm not afraid, but uh, it didn't stop me to do things because I, I really think that people is see, always will be somebody there to help if I have a problem. So I, I think it's uh, the 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 bad part of having fear is just letting the fear winning the, the battle, you know? It's like, uh, I think it's just part of, I mean, uh, sometimes also I talk that people want adventure, but a, a safe adventure. It, it doesn't yeah. exist like that. I mean, if it's not, if it's safe, it's not adventure, man. You know what is going to happen. So, um, and, and also I am not really crazy. I mean, I, I took uh, some risk, but, I also try to like be smart about it. Yeah, a little. You know, it's not like okay, I will go and do it. Well, I, I you know, I plan a little, and then if I know that I will be riding through, through a place where maybe 
nobody's going to cross for two, three days. I carry food for five days, water, you know, all these kind of things that at least I can be waiting until somebody appears. So yeah. it, it, it's, um, it's, it's crazy, but it's not completely crazy. Well, I think my, my theory on the fact that there's always somebody to help you is that that happens to people that have also helped others in situations. Like I'm sure there's been situations where you've helped other people, you know, you've needed to do something, you've been there, right? That kind of thing. It's like karma, man. It's real. And it, and it well, happens. Man, when, before Barcelona, I was living in Madrid for three years and copies of my house, I think were like 10 in town. Because always was a friend that the friend that needed a place to, to, to stay. So, you know, and now basically I'm doing the same. You know, it's, I am just going to the house of a friend or something like that. So it's, I think it's part of uh, what you, I mean, it sounds very weird, but what you give always is coming back. I mean, it's, it's uh, for sure. Yeah, agreed. I uh, also should put this up because uh, it's, it's kind of funny. Do you know who? Uh, do you know who Robert Downey Jr., the actor, the American actor, is? Ah, uh, yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that, but apparently, it's the, if that is, that's the first time. Uh, Maybe the first know, time. Yeah, yeah. What? So, so as people like, like you said, I mean, a lot of people are looking for a safe adventure, which just doesn't exist. But yeah. if you they are looking for some sense of adventure and, and I don't well, know. I mean, we, you, huh? I mean, yeah, exactly. Like we all are in a way, like we're all doing it because we want to feel alive. We want to connect with people, get questions answered. Um, but for you, if you were going to suggest when people come to you and they say, ah, oh, God, Walter, like, fuck, how do I, how do I even start doing what you're doing? How do I start to live like that? I don't know what what's one thing that you can think of that you would suggest that they did. Oof, this is complicated because um, I don't think so. It's only one thing, um, but in my case, for example, I I'm very curious, really, and and then if there are any um, if there's something that I don't know, I just try to know. I mean, it's like uh, it it doesn't mean that I know everything, uh, of course I'm not, but I just, you know, it's, uh, for example, even in a conversation, now it's very easy because we have Google, right? But, you know, I'm sometimes I'm talking with a friend and a question appears and it's like, well, man, I don't know that. So as soon as I, I have, I try to, to, to catch the, 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 the answer because basically that is going to bring another question for sure. So, Basically, what I, I will do if I, if what I do every day normally is like try to put questions on the table and, and then uh, try to, to find out uh, most of the time trying to see it for myself. I mean, it's like, yeah. uh, okay, somebody can tell you, okay, yeah, this is white. Okay, what? I, I want to, to see it if it's white for me, you know, something like that. So, yeah, let's say that basically what I do every, every day or, or normally is try to, to question everything I see all the time because uh, something that you see from one point of view now is going to change because, you, you, you know, the time pass and then you get more experience or you get different, uh, different point of view. Somebody says, hey, man. This is white, but you know, before that was black, blah, 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 blah. blah. So, yeah. And, and I think it's very, very interesting that. Have you been able to? So, what languages do you speak? Do you have, you've got English, Spanish, you have anything else? Uh, Portuguese, but I mean, it, it doesn't mean uh, a lot. If, uh, at least you go to Brazil or Portugal or yeah. some areas in Africa, but uh, even in Spanish, just, okay. And well, then. You, I you've been able to, uh, French. you, you've been able like, so with, um, Spanish and Portuguese and I mean, you've been able to, you can still like converse with people and communicate and there's all sorts of ways to do that even almost non-verbally. Well, for example, on the trip, what I was doing, it's, I was trying to learn some few words of each language I was crossing 
Um, at least, hello or thank you. But you know, the problem with that is, as soon as you say some word in local, <laughs> and then, then they respond. It's like, hey, hey, man, wait. I only know how to say thank you. You know, it's, it's uh, take it easy. Um, but um, then how to order food, for example, or, or these kind of things is quite easy now, basically. And then, for example, in, in all the uh, countries that were part of the Soviet Union, that they still use, use Cyrillic as a language, um, you, you can use um, Google to translate the images, yep. right? So, I mean, you can you don't know, as, for example, you take the menu and you put there and everything appears, but normally, you don't know exactly what you are going to order, but at least you know that will be soup or will be meat or will yeah. be chicken or something like that. How they bring it, you don't know. But, you know, at least it's, it helps a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, I've actually, I've been learning Ukrainian and Cyrillic for the last eight months. And, uh, um, and it's, it's, you're right. Like, one, it's just very hard. But two, um, everything's in context. It's like, it's like, I don't know, the difference that I'm finding between English and, and Ukrainian, for instance, is that in English, there's very, very specific ways to say a certain thing, right? Whereas in other languages, like in Hebrew and in Ukrainian, right, it's all dependent on the context. You let the other person sort of figure out what the meaning is. And, uh, and it's the same way with like the, you know, the service industry and food and, and things like that. I was there one time and they said, hey, look, we, we really only have one dish here and it's, it's meat and potatoes. And, uh, and it was fine. It was delicious. But there was a girl that, that, I, that was with us and she's like, I'm a vegetarian. I, you know, do you have anything for vegetarians? And they're like, oh yeah, we have a really special dish for that. And so, okay. So they go into the back of the kitchen and come back out and everybody has these plates of meat and potatoes, and on hers is just a single potato. <laughs> like, you know, like done. It's like, well, that's just the way that it is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You're vegetarian. You, you eat potatoes. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, it's a. Uh, I mean, and then um, also, you know, some food. Sometimes it's you know, rice is almost everywhere. So you are almost safe i mean and then on my bike i carry to cook so even if if i need i can cook so it's not a big deal i mean it's uh it's it's, it's possible so with being curious right and questioning things that you see answering trying to answer find answers to those questions right i know that maybe 30 days isn't long enough but if you were to kind of paint a picture of what somebody could do if it was just maybe asking more questions or or trying to I don't know go out and talk to somebody that you normally wouldn't have spoken with before things like that to learn something new about life. Um, if somebody did that for the next thirty days, I don't know. In your experience, what do you think they would experience? I mean, thirty days for me is a, is a really short time. I mean, it's um, but um, I don't know, man. Thirty days, it's uh, or we could forget thirty days, and maybe maybe it's the next six months. Okay, well, that's different because um, if first, I think you you need to try to know what you want. Basically, I mean, it's uh. But knowing the knowing the in the way of uh, I really want that is approx. I mean, I just want to go. You know, they're saying like, let's say six months because my my idea was to reach Vladivostok. Okay, that was I can use the, this example in this. It's I have six months to do it. Basically, uh, I could enjoy the trip, but. Consistently, I have to do some kilometers. Even one day, I have to do almost like seven hundred, just to cope with the with the timing I have. Okay, yeah. um, and in that way, I, I 
I accomplished the, the, the arrival in Vladivostok. Uh, it could be different. Yeah, of course. Maybe I never reached uh, Vladivostok, but I was reaching other place. So is you have an idea of where you want to go, but also being, in this case, I, I arrived from point A to point B, but in the, in the last two years, I have been from point A, from B, C, B, A. I passed in the same town for, I don't know, six times already because I was doing like circus, you know? So it really depends of what you want and also how you feel with that. I mean, it's, um, in, in, and if we put in photography, I think it's basically you need to shoot pictures every day. That's for sure. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's like when you do exercise, right? You do exercises for during a time until your body is getting to it. And then you, you don't need to do every day. You just can do it sometimes, but your body always is there. And with, it's the same with photography. Let's say that. I mean, it's, uh, but you need, at the beginning, you have to be like every day shooting something, at least one or something like that. Do you find that uh, it's easier to shoot people, like uh, that it's more expressive to shoot people, or is it, or are you like landscapes better, or is man, I am I'm really bad of shooting landscapes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, and because the problem with the landscapes, and this is a reason sometimes I don't shoot sometimes of the of the trip is because the 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 landscape is so beautiful, but the picture is so bad. That is like, man, why am I going to spend time trying to shoot a good picture of this? I just put the camera down and I enjoy the place. And this also connects with one question that you did before is sometimes I shoot pictures, but sometimes I just enjoy. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was in places where I was with the camera. I didn't take one frame, nothing at all. I was just enjoying the people there, you know. And sometimes also it's if people invite you to the house and you are eating with them or something like that, sometimes taking the camera out is breaking this, uh, like, place of, of, of relax, you know, because everybody will be in tension. So why? I mean, why I need to take the camera out? So basically it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't shoot pictures and that's it. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of things on the trip that nobody will see or will know. At least I tell them I was there or doing something. Yeah. And then a lot, and then a lot of moments that are just yours, you know, that you can just enjoy for yourself and know that you lived in it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, yeah. Um, when you do take pictures of people, do you mm -hmm. ask their permission um, before or after? Like, does it get awkward it, it really depends on the streets normally no i don't because I, I i like to catch like vivid moments you know like people doing things without knowing that i am taking pictures but everybody knows that you are with the camera that's i mean it's impossible uh to take pictures of to people that they don't like i mean it's like they will start covering their face they will be doing something for sure and then in festivities or something that like celebrations is easier because they they see you with a camera and they will sometimes they will well, take me a picture and in india for example everybody will stop and ask you to take a picture for sure so also depends on the countries there are countries that uh some places for example the markets in bolivia are, it's not impossible to take pictures but it's a little more complicated to take pictures in bolivia than maybe in uh, marketing Laos, for sure. Is it because of the like the social the social stigmas behind taking pictures? No, and also how the, the because you know maybe sometimes uh, the tourists there were not uh, you know were not uh, respectful. Yeah, and so when they a guy with a camera is like, oh man, go away, something like that. But uh, also maybe have something to do with with uh with beliefs but in general uh i think it's more about the behave other people had in the past so you are 
sometimes you are paying, you know, the the sin of others. So it's but it's okay. I mean, yeah. if I I am with the camera and I uh, somebody said no, I don't need to take the picture. So it's it's okay. You know? Yeah. And sometimes, exactly. for example, in Bolivia, I can be in the market standing with the camera, and they start saying no, don't take pictures, don't take pictures. Okay, I'm not taking. And you stay there. And after 30 minutes, they start, man, when are you going to take me a picture? <laughs> it's like uh, five minutes ago, you were like not. You know, it changed. My life. it changed a lot. Have you uh, have you ever gotten into a fight at all with anybody about the picture? Fight. Yeah, like a no. physical fight in any way? No, man, no, I, it, I know. We'll be like 25 years I don't fight and something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and that time because uh, the group of people was uh, beating a friend, so I, I I tried to to help, but normally I, I don't. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think that's good. I mean, that shows that you're that you're like a responsible world citizen instead of somebody that just rushes into a culture and tries to take a bunch of photos by brute force and then leave. Like, yeah, well, I mean, you know, because also in the trip is it's more to enjoy. So if why I have to be in, in a situation where I will be surrounded by people, you know, trying to 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 beat me because I was taking a picture. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And and more in places where I don't speak the language, you know. But for example, I was in the market in Russia. I, I love the markets in general. I, I really love to walk around and always I will the camera is, you know, is, is there. You can see it. And you just test, you know, you go and you jump, take the camera, and you see how the people is reacting. If the reaction at the beginning is like, oh, go away, OK, you know that you are not welcome there. So that's it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you are not welcome to take pictures, but you are welcome to walk around. Yeah, just don't disturb anything else by taking pictures. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Dude, this, I could, honestly, if we didn't have to go, I could talk to you forever about some of this stuff that you have done. Really, I, like, I'm so impressed with all the traveling that you've done. Uh, but I, wanna, I want to kind of wrap this up. What, what do you have going on as far as working now? And you know, you're, um, you're holding conferences, you're doing one-on-one -on -one sort of uh, uh, consultations, right? What kind of things do you have going on these days? How can people get in touch with you? Well, normally, um, I use, no as far as a lot of people use uh, social media, I use Instagram, that is the best way, uh, Walter Estrada. And then I use, but just for, uh, to post some uh, worship or something like that on Facebook, that is the same. Um, but mainly Instagram. And then, um, they, are, they can write directly to me, so it's easy. And then yep. also there I, uh, because, okay, one of the ways I, I before the trip, uh, since I, I was working as photographer in news agencies until I start the trip, I was teaching photography for almost eight years. Yeah, on and off. And I was traveling by plane some, sometimes to teach, I don't know, Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador, anywhere. So basically what I say is why I don't do the same but with the motorcycle. So yeah. what I'm doing now is if I know, for example, that I'm going to reach Bolivia, I was living in Bolivia before, so I have a lot of friends. So I said, guys, I'm going to be in Bolivia starting in March, for example. Uh, so why we don't uh, do a workshop for local photographers? So basically what I'm doing along the trip, besides of taking pictures also, it's I am teaching photography. I mean, it's a, it also it's a good way to connect in with a lot of people because um, I have been teaching in the, these five years in Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, India, um, then Australia, uh, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Ecuador. I mean, I was teaching all along the way except the six first the first six months because I was with this timing, the crazy timing, right? But um, so in, in that way, and then, and that also helped me to uh, to travel because uh, basically is 
the, one of the main uh, incomes to to pay my you know the the gas, the, the spare parts, uh, food, the sleeping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and then with the with this uh, with the virus, what I did is previously I was teaching photography uh, through Skype one to one, but because I was forced to do a, a, a workshop that was presential, but I passed it to online, uh, but it was a group. So, and it was so easy, man. I mean, I, I, before that I was afraid of uh, workshops online because I, I thought, oh, that can be very boring. And we're eight hours and we're ending uh, with 11 hours of workshop. So it was crazy. So after <laughs> that I said, yeah, why not? I mean why I cannot do online workshops while I'm traveling plus the the workshop that I'm doing normally. Yeah. So I'm doing that a lot now. Basically in the in the last five months I have done something like 10 or something like that. So crazy. Uh, are they all in, are they all in Spanish or are they are they all in Spanish or are they uh, in English as well? Well I did mainly in Spanish and then I did one in, in English. Uh, and English normally, I I left that for one to one or something like that because I think it's it's easier, and at least it's a group. And then also, you know, we can do a group. But normally, when I I promote the workshop, it's, it's on the online are on 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 Spanish. Okay, okay. But um, you know, anybody can write anyway, so it's okay. yeah. Well, in fact, if guys like. If you're listening to this right now um, and you're curious about photography, I encourage you to go check out Walter's stuff. And, you know, if they were to write you, because because uh, I have your WalterEstrada.com in the link, uh, the description of this. So they, they can actually contact you through there as well. They can. I mean, there are two sites. Uh, WalterEstrada.com is the site where the old project, I mean, the, the project on uh, human rights and social issues are there. But if you press on the, it's a picture of the bike coming. It's in Mongolia, in the highway of Mongolia. Uh, if you press there, you go to um, the site of the trip that is called wa.thejourney.com. And there you can see uh, the pictures I took the last five years. Also, that pictures are on selling because uh, it's part of, also part of the, of the, of the, um, of the way of, trying to make you know different ways of getting money from different sources because it's impossible to get 2000 euros from only one source it's impo almost impossible uh, even i don't spend 2000 euros per month <laughs> no not at all and then also there i do something you we, the other day we were talking about the um, the patreon yep i i don't have patreon but i have Something like the like um, how you call it, like a crowdfunding that you go to the site and you see collaborate and then work the same way. But I cannot do a Patreon because everything I do is for free. So it's impossible to be charging people to do things or things that normally they are going to have for free. So basically, if people like what I'm doing, just they can collaborate and that's it. Yep. Yeah, uh, that is the link to that collaboration, like crowdfunding site. Is that also, can they find that on WalterEstrada.com? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, good. Cause, and I was going to ask too, because Perian asked here, um, how is it that people can donate and buy photos? So basically everything, everything well, is on Well, basically that. everything is on uh, wathejourney.com because they are, if you see collaborate, you can collaborate and then I am I'm doing roughly between the people but then you go through all the pictures and you can buy them basically and we print it in Madrid and we sell uh, to the, your front door okay and what did you say about a raffle you're doing a raffle as uh, well yeah. well but, you know because normally in the crowdfunding uh, different money have different uh, rewards but I cannot be doing that because it's almost impossible. So what I do is um, between the people that collaborate, there are like three different uh, amount of money. So that amount, it's if I 
if we people put uh, 12 euros, I do a raffle between these two people of a picture they choose them. So basically you put 12 and you can get a picture that uh, costs 120 or something like that. Okay, okay. That's, dude, so cool. What all of this stuff that you got going on and ways that you're able to fund this trip and keep going. By the way, after like as this all this virus cloud dissipates and yeah. starts to become a little bit clear, do you plan on continuing the trip with the motorcycle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as soon as I can cross to Latin America, I will. Even if I need to cross to other country. Yep. First, let's say I was even checking crossing to Uruguay at least. So at least I am in South America. So from there, it's quite easy, you know. I, I did, a, I mean, if I cross that, I will do a huge jump, right? Um, my original plan was Bolivia, Peru, Peru, Ecuador, Ecuador, Colombia. And in Colombia, put the bike on a boat and um, go to Cuba. And then from there, cross into Mexico. Uh, and then normally I will go north, but now, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, but also, uh, you know, all, everything also is going to change because, for example, with Cuba, I was thinking, okay, if uh, the relation between Cuba and U.S. starts again, was with Obama was starting, I thought, okay, I go to Miami and Miami, I took a ferry, but now, everything has changed again. So basically, you know, maybe when I reach Cuba in one year, you have a ferry going from La Habana to Miami. So we don't know. That would be amazing. It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a huge, uh, really, everything can change in, in two months. So, or maybe three. So let's say that until now, I know that I will go back and then if it's possible to cross to Peru, I will start going north. If it's not, maybe I will go south to Argentina and stay there in the north that is beautiful and have a lot of roads to do. And then when everything is quiet and it's possible to travel like normal, I will go to Peru again and start going up. I think it's just amazing that not, I mean, it sounds like it's, to, to somebody that's not familiar with traveling around on motorcycles, it sounds like it's a lot of decision making and a lot of uncertainty. But I feel like to people like you and, and me, that's what's so special about it is that you have the flexibility to figure that out and just work, you know, and, and let the trip mold itself. And basically, the, the good thing of, of traveling like this is like, I mean, um, you you can adapt easily uh, of what is next you know it's like um for example my plan in peru is you are able to stay there for six months so i will try to be there for six months because it's a huge country has a lot of things to do uh there are many places i know already but like 25 years ago so everything has changed for sure yeah. I was talking with a friend about Laos and she went two months ago. No, sorry, two years ago and had changed a lot since I was there four years ago. So, you know, so it's, can you uh, imagine 25 years and how much has changed? Yeah. Amazing. Imagine yeah. in 25. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you, man, I will be following you, right? And the entire journey. And hopefully, one of these days we will end up crossing paths and who knows, maybe we can yeah, end up riding. We do. Yeah, we do for sure. Yeah, we do the, the cut. Yeah, that would be amazing. I mean, I feel oh, like, uh, <laughs> oh man, this virus. I hate this virus. Yeah, yeah, I really hate it, man. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, man, this has been such an awesome, amazing conversation. I just want to say thanks for your time. There's people commenting. Perian says she doesn't want you to go. You've got place to stay in the U.S. You've got friends here. So I tell you, and if you. If you find yourself in Key West in anywhere in the near future, of course, come visit. You got a place to stay here, like. Uh, and we do the the West Wing. Damn straight, I love it, dude. So, so again, uh, guys, check out 
WalterEstrada.com. Check out WATheJourney.com. And I'll actually put that second link in the comments so that people can click on that directly. Uh, cool. And man, thanks again for the time. This has been incredible. You're an inspiration to a lot of people, including myself. Thank you, man. So, all right, guys. Well, this is it. We're wrapping it up just over an hour. One of the longest yet, but well-deserved because it's such a cool topic. And, uh, and man, Walter, just want to say thanks again. Uh, and we are signing off for another episode of Fire Builders Live. Thanks, guys, for sticking with us. And we'll see you later. Adios. Adios. Bye.